Hello, I'm Dr. James Schloss. I recently got my PhD from the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University. I'm now working at MIT, working on the Klima Repository, which is a climate machine, and I particularly focus on GPU engineering, that is, high-performance computing with focus on massively parallel computation. The research I've been doing up to this point could be largely considered research software engineering. And today, I want to talk to you about what I see to be a big problem in the field of research software engineering itself. To do this, we're going to start by talking about the different types of software that researchers need. Then we'll talk about the publication economy, which is what I call the publish or perish cycle within academia itself. After that, we want to talk about the software development practices that are kind of entrenched into the academic system as a whole, followed by a clear definition of the problem statement and solutions. So first, let's start talking about the types of research software. First of all, we have low-level libraries. Think BLAST, LAYPAC, FFTW. These are things that users don't typically interact with, at least researchers don't, but they're underpinning a lot of key software that people use. Then there are software frameworks and languages like Julia, NumPy, and Root. After that, there's specialized simulation software, which is lab-dependent. In particular, I built GPUE for my PhD, which is a GPU-based gross Pevsky equation solver, which was particularly useful for superfluid simulations. After that, we have specific scientific scripts used for one publication and then typically thrown out or dropped into Dropbox or something like that. Now, a key takeaway from this slide is that different labs need different software, but most labs need some form of software. On top of that, scientific software usually requires some form of domain-specific knowledge. You can't write a fancy quantum physics solver without any knowledge of quantum physics. Now I want to talk about a key issue with academia itself, and I call this the publication economy. This is something everyone knows and loves to hate on, and essentially it's the publish or perish cycle. You as a researcher usually have two options. You publish, or you lose your academic status. This is how most young researchers see academia today. You basically need to keep pumping out papers in order to survive. One key problem with this is that even though publications are reviewed based on the peer review system, code is not. So if you're writing code for a publication, this code is not usually checked. Instead, the publications are usually checked based on physical intuition or whatever other metric people decide to use for their peer review. The last issue is funding. Simply put, the funding for research usually comes from grants, where software engineering is only considered to be a small part. So there's usually not much money floating around for research software engineering explicitly. So here, researchers have no real incentive to write good, clean code. It doesn't pay them well, nor does it help with their career development. In addition, the skills of a research software engineer are also not typically used in other areas of software engineering. So if you want to do research software engineering, it could be hard to find a job following that up. In this way, research software engineering is kind of a dead-end job for both researchers and software engineers who might want to move forward in their respective fields. My point is that if your results depend on software, this software must be robust. Otherwise, the entire process fails. And because there's no incentive for researchers to write good code, this means there's probably a lot of crappy code underpinning some very fundamental papers in the field. From personal experience, when I found an interesting paper, a few times I've actually asked for the code for this paper, and I found that the code does something radically different than the paper actually says it should. And this is a big problem that definitely needs to be fixed. So now I want to talk about software development practices for those trained in academia. The first problem I'm going to bring up is a problem I'm going to call the MATLAB problem. Now, if you've ever been to any of my live streams, you'll know that I have a deep and fiery hatred of MATLAB. One of the big reasons for this is that I feel like MATLAB actually entrenches bad programming practices into people's code. That is to say, when you write MATLAB code, you typically write it with very few functions, very few structs, loops, or include files. Basically, your code is going to be very MATLAB-esque. You rephrase everything in the form of matrix multiplications and equations and stuff like this, which is great from a mathematics perspective, but very, very different than many other software languages. Now on top of that, when you're trained in academia, you're usually not trained about version control, which is absolutely essential for most scientific research. When you think about it, version control is a built-in lab notebook. This simply means that you get a backup of all your code you've ever written, and you can see exactly when and why you made changes as long as you keep your history clean. And that's incredibly important. It's actually incredibly weird to me, the fact that version control has not caught on in academia, because again, it is that built-in lab notebook. It's incredibly useful to keep track of your day-to-day -day activities. If you're trained in academia, more than likely you don't often test your code. You don't have unit tests, you don't have integration tests, and probably the code is not very well documented. Again, this is because the funding does not go towards software development, the funding goes towards research, which means you have little incentive to write very robust code. 
Now, this means that if anyone else is trying to use your code for their own purposes, it's usually very difficult for them to do so because they don't know how to even get started, nor can they really trust whether the code is actually producing correct results because, again, it doesn't have the appropriate tests or unit tests. Academics are simply not trained how to write proper code with testing, documentation, and everything else. This is something that should come as a part of typical graduate curriculums, but it's simply missing in most fields. Finally, there's little consideration for the hardware that they're running on, which usually is not going to be too big of a deal if you're just writing scientific scripts. But a lot of times, people will be writing scripts specifically for high-performance computing, where the ballpark is entirely different. With high-performance computing, you typically need to think about parallelism, distributed compute nodes, all this kind of stuff. So all these things put together, research software written by people who were trained in academia without any external training will tend to be rather rough. The takeaway from this slide is that academia does not encourage good software development. Now, that doesn't mean that people trained in academia can't become good software developers. But I do argue that they become good software developers in spite of academia, not because of it. So here's a clear problem statement for what we're dealing with. Research software engineers are not funded with money or publications. Now, like I said before, academia runs off of a publication economy. If we could provide research software engineers an adequate number of publications, they could continue in academia and move their way through the academic route. But right now, we simply don't have that option. Research software engineering is typically considered something distinctly different than research itself. And because of this, very few publications usually go to research software engineers, meaning that if they want to be academics in the future, typically it's going to be very difficult for them to balance both the research and the research software. On top of that, like I said before, funding for research software engineering is sometimes pretty hard to come by. So what are the solutions? Well, one solution is just to give research software engineers publications, right? That's the idea behind the Journal of Open Source Software. Here, basically you publish your software with some sort of abstract related to the code. Now, again, people don't really care about the novelty of the code here. They just care that the code is there, it's written, it's documented, it's tested. The question of novelty will come from the number of citations that you're given. Now, the truth is a lot of people don't like this open source model because they feel like Joss is just publishing anything and I understand that criticism. On the other hand, if research software engineers are given a publication based on what they can publish in JOS, that's actually really nice because now they could, in some ways, continue to start working in academia, even if they took a few year break working as a research software engineer for some big project. Another rather obvious solution is to fund research software engineering a bit more than you typically fund software engineering. This means when you write a grant, you actually apply for a bit extra for research software engineering. And I'm going to say here that my current employer is doing a very good job of this. We are, in my opinion, funding research software engineers as they should be. We treat them as software engineers, and they're pretty well integrated into the research ecosystem. Another big issue that needs to be solved is that we need to review code alongside publications. So this isn't necessarily a big issue with research software engineering itself. This is actually an issue with academia. If code underpins a research publication, then that code needs to be reviewed along with the rest of the publication. The fact is that a lot of times the peers doing the review don't know enough programming to actually review that aspect of the publication. And that, in my opinion, is a big problem that needs to be solved. Finally, another good solution here is to embrace open source and contribute back when necessary. The idea here is that the open source model actually works pretty well for research, right? Because if you're going to peer review some particular code, well, if it's open, it's much easier to review. On top of that, by contributing back to basic libraries, again, like Laypack, Blast, uh, FFTW, Julia, these types of packages here, you can actually then help many different labs who are all struggling with the same fundamental issue. And that's really good for academia as a whole. Now, as a note, before continuing here, I want to say that headway has been made in all of these areas. As of the past few years, people are genuinely doing their best to make sure that research software is treated as part of the academic process. The fact is that some people, predominantly in the older generation, tend to see software as less important. But nowadays, most of the newer researchers see it as an absolutely essential tool for many different fields. I guess the bottom line for this discussion is the following. If scientists are in the business of creating high quality replicable scientific results, the software they use must be considered part of that process. That's basically all I wanted to say. I know it's a bit of a rant. I don't normally post rants like this on my YouTube channel, but I felt that this was relatively important. I've been struggling with this myself with my own scientific career, and I know a lot of people in the community do genuinely feel like they might want to be research software engineers in the future. For that reason, I think it's fair to have this discussion with the community, either in the comment sections here or on Twitch or wherever you can find me. I think it's important to talk about the issues at the intersection between software and research. And again, like I said, there is headway being made in all of these areas. But yeah, that's all I have for today. Links will be in the description for GitHub, GitHub sponsors, Twitch, and Discord. Feel free to check them out if you're interested. Outside of that, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.